Before we look into common intention constructive trust, it will be helpful if we know about the case of Stack and Dalton. So the facts are as follows. We have Ms. Dalton and Mr. Stack, who became couples in 1975. In 1983, they started cohabitation. So Mr. Stack moved into a house which had been bought in Ms. Dalton's sole name. They have four children. In 1993, they decided to sell the old house and move into a new one. For the new house, it was conveyed into joint names of the couple. So Mrs. Sack and Mrs. Alden were joint tenants. This was how they contributed to the purchase price. 65% came from funds of a building society account held by Mrs. Alden. For the rest, they were from a loan secured by a mortgage in their party's joint names and two endowments, one in their joint names and one in Mrs. Alden's sole name. Miss Seldon paid for the premium still under the endowment in her sole name and 60% of the mortgage loan. Mr. Stack paid for mortgage interest, premium due under the endowment in their joint names and 40% of the mortgage loan. In 2002, the couple separated. Mr. Stack left the property. Miss Seldon and the children stayed at the house. Later on, Mr. Stack applied for a sale of the property and a declaration for equal division of the proceeds of sale. So the case went all the way up to the UK House of Lords. Lady Hale gave a leading judgment for the majority. According to Lady Hale, Mr. Stack and Mr. Soden were legal joint tenants. But what about the position in equity? The rule is equity follows the law. This is the presumption that should be applied in domestic context. So, Mr. Stack and Mr. Soden are beneficial joint tenants. In other words, they held both legal and beneficial interests jointly and equally. So, Mr. Zack is arguing that there should be equal division, but Ms. Zeldin said that there shouldn't be. So, Ms. Zeldin bears the burden to rebut the presumption of equity follows the law. But how can Ms. Zeldin do so? According to Lady Hill, the presumption of resulting trust is not a rule of law. Instead, we have to rely on common intention constructive trust. In Lady Hell's words, the search is to ascertain the party shared intentions, actual, inferred, or imputed, with respect to the property in light of their whole course of conduct in relation to it. So, in order to rebut the presumption of equity follows the law, we have to establish common intention constructive trust, and to apply it into our case. So Lady Hell observes that Mr. Stack and Ms. Seldon each made separate savings and investments. The only things they have in joint names were the house and associated endowment policies. Another observation Lady Hell made is that Ms. Seldon in fact contributed much more than Mr. Stack to the purchase. In conclusion, Lady Hell held that the parties didn't intend their shares in the property to be equal, so the appeal should be dismissed. So Ms. Seldon should get 65% of the beneficial interest and Mrs. Stack should get 35% of it. So this is how common intention constructive trust should be applied in a co-ownership context. In fact, Lady Hill went forward and explained how common intention constructive trust should be applied in the sole ownership context. And she endorsed the case of Oxley and Hiscock. In that case, property was conveyed in the sole name of one of the cohabitants. And what marks the difference between a sole ownership case and a co-ownership case is that for a sole ownership case, the claimant has to overcome two hurdles. One is to show that both parties intended the claimant to hold beneficial interests. This means that the claimant has to show express or inferred intention that the claimant should hold at least some beneficial interests and detrimental reliance by the claimant. This can be financial contribution to the property. And after overcoming the first hurdle, the claimant has to show what is the quantity of the interest. For a co-ownership case, the claimant only has to overcome the second hurdle. The first hurdle will be overcome automatically because the house itself is already conveyed in joint names. So how can we ascertain the quantity of the interest? We have to look at the party's whole course of dealing. So this is how common intention constructive trust will be applied in a sole ownership case. This is the majority approach. Now let's move on to the minority approach. So according to Lord Newberger, the starting point is also equity follows the law. But what marks the difference between the majority and the minority approach is how to rebut this presumption. 
So according to Lord Neuberger, we first have to ask how the beneficial interest is owned at the time of acquisition. So we'll have to look at the party's contribution to the purchase price. So this is when the presumption of resulting trust, and for the case of Hong Kong, presumption of advancement come into play. So after asking how the parties intended the share of the property should be divided at the time of acquisition, we ask whether there is any change of their common intention after acquisition. So this is when common intention constructive trust seeps into the analysis. As according to Lord Neuberger, we need compelling evidence to prove that there is a change in the party's intention. So we we'll have to look at the whole course of conduct of the parties to see if there is any change in common intention among the parties with regard to beneficial ownership of the property after acquisition. So applying Lord Neuberger's approach to the present case, at the time of acquisition, Ms. Tolden contributed 65% and Mr. Stack contributed 35%. Nothing suggests that there is a change subsequent to acquisition. Therefore, the appeal should be dismissed. So as you can see, the majority and the minority approach reached the same conclusion. And for a summary of the case, so here we see that Stat and Dalton is a case concerning how we can ascertain the party's shares in a property, legal and beneficial. So as always, we start with the legal position. The presumption is equity follows the law. But how can we rebut the presumption? Say for the claimant, as in the case of Ms. Dalton, how can she rebut the presumption of equity follows the law? There are two approaches. We have the majority approach and the minority approach. For the majority's approach, we have to establish a common intention constructive trust. So for the case of sole ownership, we have two hurdles. For the case of co-ownership, there is only one hurdle. That is the second hurdle that we have to overcome. So if we follow Lord Newberger's approach, then we have to ask what is the common intention at the time of acquisition. So this is the time where the presumption of resulting trust, and for the case of Hong Kong, presumption of advancement come into play. After ascertaining the party's common intention at the time of acquisition, we ask whether there is a change in their common intention after the time of acquisition. And we need compelling evidence to prove such a change. And this is when common intention constructive trust seeps into the analysis because we have to look at the whole course of conduct of the parties. So this is all we have to know about the case of Seth and Dalton. Thanks for watching.